and welcome to Round Robin. I'm your host, Robin McCormick, with the City of Hampton's Communications and Marketing Department. And today we're going to talk with two historians about a particular point in Hampton's history during the Civil War. My guests are Mike Cobb from the History Museum. Robin. Welcome, Mike. I think you're my most frequent guest, so I'm not going to tell uh, anything else about you. And with Holt. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And um, with us introduce you a little bit. Um, first of all, Okay, your name, Whiff and Holt, tells me uh, yeah. old, a couple of I old was, Hampton families. I was born and reared here. Uh, my family has been here for several generations. Uh, I went off to teach, though, and I taught at law at the University of Alabama for 40 years, retiring back here. So you came back to Hampton? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And you are a historian as well as law professor. Yes, I'm a legal historian. Legal historian, okay. <clears throat> and so how did this collaboration um, between the two of you and also a third partner um, come about? Well, Ed Hicks uh, is our third author and he is employed by the museum. He's a, a co-curator at the museum and Whiff has been volunteering with us for a number of years mm -hmm. oh. and has done great work at the museum. We're very lucky to have someone of his statue uh, working with Thank us. You. And be able to give of your time like that, that well, is wonderful. I have, I'm retired but I really like the museum and I love history so we have an excellent museum. We do have an excellent museum. So we came together uh, with this idea to do a book on the Battle of Big Bethel and uh, the reasons for it is primarily Big Bethel is the first land battle of the American Civil War. And honestly, if you interviewed people, even people who know something about the Civil War, I mean, how many people know that? I don't think it ever pops up um, on people's radar. In the great histories of the war, uh, James McPherson's books and others, uh, often it's overlooked. And you, you start with Fort Sumter, then you go to Bull Run. Right. And Which is five weeks later than Bethel. So you're missing the whole of the spring there in the early summer. So we wanted to look at this uh, battle and not only the guns and bugles aspects of it, the fighting, but importantly, and the reason we did it, we wanted to put it in the context with the rest of the war and the social history and the political history that was moving around it. So Big Bethel, the book that we did, you're going to find the battle, you're going to find the gun smoke here for sure, but you're going to also see the ramifications, what it meant and uh, many other aspects of it. It's a good, good book. And what came into the beginning of it, why it happened and what the politics were before and after because of Bethel. So can you talk about, I know people should read the book and, um, and we will do a book plug and I know you can buy it at the History Museum. I saw it there last week. Um, but but how, how did this come about? I mean, how, how did, uh, well, yeah, well, you tell me. <laughs> first, we thought that Hampton needed a very good history of important events that have happened here. Bethel is one of the most important things that happened here. Uh, I was fortuitously volunteering at the museum and I could help. And Mike and Ed have done years of research on this battle. We did more after we started the project, but they had really done an amazing amount of useful and good research. So it was all in place to do it. So we just sat down and did it after a while. So what <clears throat> led to this battle? I mean, how, do we, how, how did we get there? It was, it was in many ways, um, I don't want to say accident, but early in the war, Union forces are massing at Fort Monroe, Freedom's Fort. Which is what, not real, is it the furthest south place that's controlled by the Union at this point or no, almost? No, but it's the, most, it's the most important place that they control because it's 90 miles from Richmond. And it's the, the only Confederate place in capital. Virginia. Right, close to the Confederate it's capital. It's the okay. only place in Virginia. There were some places in Florida and oh, that's Alabama right. that stayed in Union hands. But this was the important one because it was so close to Richmond. And the Confederates were massing around the historic town of Yorktown to defend against a Union advance up the peninsula towards Richmond. Because that's what they expected. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So they're building on the old Revolutionary War earthworks, um, strengthening their fortifications, and they put an outpost out a few miles outside of Yorktown at a place called uh, uh, Big Bethel. And it was, the name comes from the church that was there. It was Big Bethel Church. So they erect some fortifications and the Federals know that this is happening, and General Butler launches an attack on Big Bethel. And, and when, what time frame wise? 
What this is, is the end of May when it's raining and Hampton votes to secede, and then the beginning of June, Magruder does this challenging thing of building a fortification almost within sight of Hampton at the border between York County and Elizabeth City County to challenge the Federals. Both Magruder and Butler were very aggressive generals. And so Butler rose to the occasion and sent his troops up there. And so what happens next is the Federals have a very complicated, actually too complicated plan for green troops, inexperienced officers and inexperienced men. They have a two-pronged attack. The, the two forces will, lead, will begin to march on Bethel in the night. One force from Fort Monroe, but the Federals also had another outpost at Newport News Point called Camp Butler. So in the night, two convergent forces are moving through the dark towards Great Bethel. And as they move through, they collide at a place called Little Bethel, very close to the uh, Big Bethel fortifications. And there's a friendly fire incident where in the night, uh, two regiments collide, thinking that they're the enemy, and fire, and there's significant casualties. Many operations have been called off, but not this one. General Ebenezer Pierce, who was a commander on the ground, decided to continue. Well, his orders were to continue. He <laughs> felt that he couldn't change them. Okay. So uh, the two groups of Union troops, one from Newport News, one from Fort Monroe, now together march somewhat disjointedly towards the battle because they just fired on each other. And 21 casualties had resulted. And ca by casualties, is that wounded and dead? Two or? dead, 19 wounded. Okay. And uh, it was pretty upsetting, as you can imagine, but nevertheless, there were 4,400 northern troops moving. As it turned out, there were only 1,500 maximum Confederate troops at Bethel. And at, when you say at Bethel, the battle takes place, what is it now? What is the land we're thinking of? Is it? It's where the reservoir okay. is uh, out there um, uh, at Great Bethel. Most of the battlefield is underwater, unfortunately, today. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. Very sad. But what happens next is after the friendly fire incident, uh, uh, troops are moving and the Confederates are actually moving out of their fortifications as well. And then a heroine comes along, Hannah Tunnell. And Hannah is a local woman and she knows the Federals are in the vicinity and she wants to warn her friends and neighbors, the con Confederates, and she goes to the rebels and warns them of the approach of the Yankees. So uh, I, I saw this actually in your um, Halloween tour of, yes. uh, of, of, of it, we got to the graveyard at St. John's. Frightening. So Hannah is, and this is an example too of how wars aren't just the military forces. No. It's the community and the people who are involved. So Hannah really is just a young woman who- She's not young. Oh, okay. But she's, this was tough for what in those days would have been considered elderly. She was probably between 40 and 50. Okay. Elderly for those days. But she set off through the woods. She knew the woods, she knew the roads, and she encountered Magruder and his troops who were coming out to see what was going on. And they knew enough to go back, thanks to Mrs. Tunnel. They'd also heard the friendly fire, but Mrs. Tunnel confirmed that there were lots of Northern troops heading towards Bethel, and so they got their troops turned around and went back in to their fortifications. A very wise maneuver. So <clears throat> then, is there a battle? What, what exactly mm -hmm. happens? Um, with, the, with, all the, with all the noise, there's no surprise. Butler had originally intended the nighttime attack to surprise. Boy, that would have been a different uh, outcome, right? It, would have been, it probably would have been a reverse outcome, but as it turns out, all of the Confederates get back into the fortifications. There's part of it on the Elizabeth City County side and most of it on the York County side, circling the church. What you can see now is just the cemetery that was behind the church. The, it, the, it, the, the site of the church is underwater, as well as most of where the battle occurred today because it's been dammed up. <clears throat> but the Confederates were ready. Uh, they were very, very well hidden. They had spent three days not only building the fortification, but disguising it with trees and branches 
And the Union Army came into sight. If you go up Big Bethel Road and you get to the Valero gas station, that's about where the Union Army uh, formed itself into lines and began to fight. And when they got to what well, well now it was the Valero gas station, that was called Buzzard's Roost then, and it was a stage stop on the stage from Hampton to Yorktown. Oh my gosh. So there was a little convenience store, say, <laughs> there. They began to form um, Major Randolph, who was the artillerist of the Confederates, had spent the day before pacing off the distances, so he knew exactly how far what angle to use. Oh, yeah. And you when have to the, do that with the cannon. When the uh, northern forces got to, we'll say, the Valero gas station, he'd already sighted that, and the first shot came out and decimated the northern forces. The first shot was really uh, an important shot, hitting a lot of people and really demoralizing, demoralized troops further. Uh, the... Federals had three avenues of attack which they used, each of which was beaten back by the Confederates because they were entrenched, because they had artillery, and because they'd had the surprise. They knew what was happening. Well, I tell you what, a good thing that, uh, that name Valero wasn't there back in the Civil War. It could have been the Battle of Valero. <laughs> Valero, Valero instead of that. No, shot. but that was where the Union troops formed. People who want to go up and see the battlefield, what little is left of it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they can at least know that that's where the battle began and that's where the first artillery shot fell and the first Union dead were created by the shot. Then there's several other Union onslaughts against the Confederate uh, earthworks, but they were repulsed as well, and the battle ends, and the Federals are routed, are absolutely routed. One officer, Justin Kilpatrick, finds himself astride a mule with a stick, using it as a sword, sort of directing the retreat, and there's a lot of incidents that, 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 that go on here. But Don't so, say that stick was a croquet mallet, but I doubt you're going to have a croquet <laughs> mallet out in the woods in the middle of a battle. <laughs> Two incidents of, of note, uh, Theodore, Theodore Winthrop is killed, and he is the aide to General Butler. Winthrop is a very brave man, and he's a staunch abolitionist. And he is killed leading his troops and falls. Somehow... Uh, General Daniel Harvey Hill, one of the Confederate commanders, found his diary and probably that evening or soon thereafter read it. Now what's interesting about this, Robin, is D.H. Hill is a staunch secessionist. Rabid. Hated Northerners. And his opponent, Winthrop, is a staunch abolitionist. So you have both extremes really? in America at this time. And Winthrop's diary is is essentially saying that he is coming down to Virginia to extinguish the evil of slavery. And Hill reads this and writes to his wife, Isabel, talking about this deluded man who's coming here to uh, change the way of life in the South and how evil that is. So the two extremes are portrayed. Even how fortunate it was that he got killed so he couldn't he fulfill his, his, mission. his goal. And that's one of the great things we found in this research. That document was found at Carlisle Barracks in Pennsylvania. And it's one of the things in the historian's life where you have this, this, this piece of history that we never could have anticipated in that detail and that kind of turn. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that gives fire and real reason for this book, that kind of story. Let me emphasize that all of these early incidents which were demoralizing to the federal troops didn't keep them from being brave and valorous. When it came to charging, they charged three times into the teeth of this fire with people being mown down and yet they still charged until their officers told them, okay, well, it's time to we quit. Retreat. We come off thinking that the reason the Confederates won the battle are, are several. One that D.H. Hill and John B. Magruder, who commanded the Confederates, both were veterans of war. They had fought in the Mexican War, under, uh, fought heavy odds uh, in Mexico, and they knew fighting, they knew bloodshed, and they both were there commanding the Confederates, while the Union forces were not that fortunate. Their commanders were generally inexperienced. Also, they were behind fortifications, 
which to, the rebel the soldiers didn't want to dig fortifications. They did not want to do okay. that manual work. Well, a lot of work, yeah. They were soldiers. You know, they were out to fight, <laughs> and they weren't going to do menial work. But after the Battle of Bethel, they were thankful that they had those dirt, dirt embankments between them and the bullets that were flying. Hill said they began shaking hands with their spades and thanking them. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so there's going to be a whole lot more stories um, like what you've shared today yes. if, if we go read your book. There are a lot. We have, I think, mined what there is, and it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating to read the little stories inside the battle. Well, why do you think this battle is um, overshadowed and, and not very well known? Well, it, part of the reason is at the time, it was the biggest thing that they knew. And like any kind of first, you ten, tend to remember it. But what happens is, a few weeks later, the Battle of Bull Run, our first Manassas is fought outside of Washington. And that had many more uh, troops involved, uh, many, more many more casualties. And it was also in the seat of the war. It was right outside of Washington, the capital. And so it it certainly overshadowed Bethel at the time. And it had the media attention and the political right. attention of the day, Well, I the politicians suppose. went out to watch it from D.C., and many of them had to take off running, Congressman Alfred Ely and others. In fact, there's a, a woman got between Congress, Congressman Ely and his carriage, and he tossed her out of the way and hopped on his carriage and, and took off. He had to live that down. But Well, another reason is that Bethel didn't have any strategic consequences. <clears throat> it didn't change anybody's minds. It didn't change the balance of power. Both sides retreated after the battle, even though the Confederates won a resounding victory. They didn't stay. They retreated. By that night, there were no people left there, according to the uh, northern scouts that went back to look. So it didn't have strategic importance. It didn't change the way the war was going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Manassas was 10 times bigger in terms of casualties, in terms of uh, publicity. But it was kind of a foreshadowing, yes. really, of the way the war was going to go yes. for the next maybe year or so at least. Well, right? it, it, it's, it solidified the Southerners in their belief that they really were going to win this war because they were better warriors. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they looked like they were better warriors at the battle. It also consolidated Northern opinion in behind the Northern uh, side. They didn't want to lose, and this made them more anxious to volunteer. It got a lot more volunteers. It made them more anxious to fight this war. Henry Lawson Wyatt was the first Southerner to fall in battle. Now, that's arguable. There's all kind of other contestants here. But, but what happens is 750,000 soldiers, north and south, will follow Wyatt to the grave. So this battle of Big Bethel foreshadows the great onslaught in terror that's going to befall America in the years of between 1861 and 1865. The bloodiest war ever per capita. That's just United amazing. States well, history. thank you all for doing this research and telling this story. Um, who published your book? It's a Civil War publisher from California named Savas Beattie, and they worked with us very nicely and encouraged us a lot. It's, it's, I think people will find that it's an interesting book, but also a nice looking book. And it's a resource both for Civil War people, for history, mm -hmm. and really for Hampton. I mean, right. that, that is a huge part of Hampton's story and one of those Hampton impact nationally right. that I think hasn't necessarily been told all the way And in until the text now. and even in the footnotes, I tried to emphasize the people from Hampton, the local people who were involved. So Hamptonians may even find an ancestor or two there. Well, that's great. Thank you. And, and I look forward to um, maybe some more talks or some book signings. And uh, I hope you let people know um, this resource that's out there. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very thank you, much. Robin. Thank you for coming by. And thank you. I hope you've learned a little more about the, this important battle that took place in Hampton and uh, may want to go to the History Museum or somewhere else and pick up a copy of this book. Thank you.